In this episode, we'll be talking about how to use space as a design tool. We'll talk about what does it mean to prototype and what does prototyping really mean. And we'll talk about what you can learn from the people who make high-end guitars. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Scott, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you build organizations that put people at the heart of their business. My guest in this episode is a teacher. He's an author of the book Make Space, a legendary book Make Space. And he's also a musician who has instruments spread out all over America that are now coming back to Austin. His name is Scott Widoff. Scott has a really interesting perspective on how to use space as a design material. And I think that's super interesting and important for service designers to understand as our physical environment uh, plays a huge part in how we actually experience services. So we can learn a lot from Scott. It's a different episode than the ones maybe you used to, but nevertheless, super interesting. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe because we bring new videos to help you level up your service design skills at least once a week. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the talk with Scott. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks, Mark. Cool to be here with you. You know, I um, I have to tell you a secret. I'm I'm a big fan. I think I had the first edition of Make Space the day after it was released, something <laughs> like that. So I'm 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 a huge fan, and uh, it's an honor to have you on the show. Wow! Thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, that was that was a really cool uh, putting that book together. Well, doing the work in the book for one, and then uh, putting that book together. Uh, you know, with Scott Dorley and so many other people was hmm. just awesome. And it's been really spectacular to hear how, uh, I don't know, how, how lots of different organizations and people have been using the content in ways that we had no, <laughs> had no idea that, uh, that it was going to take shape that way. It's really neat. It yeah, and I can imagine, I don't know, the book is, uh, I, I checked it before we went online. The book is from 2012, so it's seven years ago. And it, yeah. do, it, do you feel it's still haunting you or are you still happy that it has such a long uh, half-life? Oh, haunt, I don't know. That's a good question. Haunting is such a loaded <laughs> word. Uh, actually, I mean, the. I just interacted with some teachers uh, yesterday, in fact, on uh, <laughs> Twitter, um, on the MakeSpace uh, Twitter feed on there. And they were sharing information about how they were prototyping a classroom layout for a new the new school year. So it was a middle school. And in that sense, uh, if that's haunting, I'm delighted to be haunted. <laughs> it was just awesome. I, and literally, I learned some brand new tactics and some brand new uh, needs mm. that uh, different teachers and different organizations are looking for. So in one way, that's just oh, amazing. Another Quick thing is, it's been released in or translated into, I don't know, four or five different languages now. And it is uh, since 2012, you know, to now. Um, and it's really neat to see how uh, literally like different cultures are interpreting the content and kind of making it, not that it was old particularly, but making it new uh, mm. in the sense that, oh, it's now translated uh, for their of market or their audience contextualizing and, it i guess right yeah yeah and it's great uh it's it's yeah so uh haunt away please <laughs> where have you uh landed now in 2019 what is your existing current role yeah it's landed is a great a great way to put that i feel like i might uh actually be like a satellite re-entering a different orbit. Uh, <laughs> I just recently moved back to Austin, Texas, uh, where I had lived uh, previously. I went to school here actually for graduate school uh, in 99 and then worked in, in uh, engineering practice here until 2006. 
Anyway, I'm back at uh, the University of Texas at Austin at the School of Design and Creative Technologies. Uh, and I just uh, took a role here as associate professor of practice, uh, focusing mostly on 3D design, uh, meaning physical stuff like embodied, I can touch it, I can poke it, mm, mm. Um, in an effort to introduce uh, 3D and industrial design to the design program, which hasn't been articulated in that way uh, previously. Mm. It's interesting, uh, really interesting for me to have you on the service design show as a lot of the things in service design are intangible. We're designing concepts, mm. we're designing scenarios, we're designing journeys, experiences, and sort of the, uh, I don't know, the chasm between the intangible things and making them tangible is something that I, um, I really, really enjoy. So looking forward to the topics uh, you shared with me. Just a question uh, before we dive into them, which I ask all my <laughs> guests. Um, it, Service design, is that a term uh, that you're familiar with? And if so, do you remember where, when you got, and maybe also where you got in touch with that? Uh, well, I have a recency bias. Of course, I, I fairly recently brushed up on what I think your interpretation of service design is versus maybe experience design or uh, interaction design. Um, I think conversationally, uh, it first popped up to me, I'd say in, uh, yeah, when I was living and working in the Palo Alto, San mm. Francisco Bay Area, um, and it gets discussed as a concept among uh, many types of design. Sometimes it's, there's an effort to differentiate it from another like a user experience. Is that service design or experience design in a retail environment, for example? Mm, mm. Oh, is that service design or is that experience design or is that interaction design? Um, so I, I think the conversationally, I'd say, uh, well, I should say it came up <laughs> conversationally first among designers who were talking about just the wide spectrum of design. It's it's interesting because I uh, from the guests that I ha have seen on the show from the U.S. who don't who sort of are more in the California scene, um, <laughs> service design isn't such a uh, known or widely spread thing. Well, mm. people from more from uh, Dallas and the New York, the, maybe the East Coast, where sort of I don't know, it feels that it's more woven into the fabric over there. Let's not talk a lot too much about uh, semantics. Let's just dive into the topics because uh, I'm really excited about them. Are you ready to do some uh, interview jazz? Sure, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. First one topic that is, of course, we, we have to start with this one. And this one is called using space as a design tool. And do you have a question started that goes along with this one? Okay, using show it to space us. Yeah, using space as a design tool. A question that I can think of might be more of a provocation, actually, is uh, is when will uh, organizations that are building out new spaces, maybe for their uh, organization, for different populations, when will they uh, actually use space as a design tool as opposed to a designed tool? tool <laughs> elaborate uh, elaborate because because but, spaces are designed right that's 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 what architecture is all about i guess yeah uh, hopefully you know fingers hopefully. crossed <laughs> i think there's a yes I, they're definitely designed i'd say um i'm actually teaching a class right now or prototyping a class in prototyping physical spaces and in putting together a, like a syllabus for that uh, I was thinking of, I had just some concepts, but anyway, uh, it seems to me that all spaces are designed, uh, like whether intentionally or accidentally, mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully mm -hmm. we can lean toward the intentional. intentional. Yeah. Uh, and I, maybe accidentally is great, uh, if it, if it leads to something, but, uh, doesn't seem like a good operating procedure. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm curious, um, about how organizations 
I'll be specific. Say there's a, a healthcare organization that says, ah, oh, we want to be more innovative. Or there's a, like a municipal library that's saying, oh, we want people to act differently in this space. Or there's a retail environment, like a, I don't know, a coffee shop. Ah, we want people to come in here and feel like it's different. Uh, very frequently, that effort is great. Super cool. People are paying attention to the environment and saying, oh, this, is, this has impact. This actually makes quite a bit of difference. It's not just our physical product. It's maybe not just our business model, our price point. It's actually the reality of being here. And what does that mean to a, a, a user, whether that's a customer mm -hmm. or a participant, mm -hmm. what have you. Uh, it's great. There is an interesting, I don't know, point or threshold at which an organization might hold back on saying, ah, I want people that come in here to be able to use the space as they want or as a tool in support of a behavior or an activity that they're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's not just about having like plywood on the walls to communicate, ah, oh, this is a rough place and ah, mm -hmm, this is where mm -hmm. we make things. It's mm -hmm. actually saying, oh, can you screw something into that wall right now? Can you engage that wall? Uh, or it's not just having sort of pretty items on casters. It's actually looking at sort of high-end rolling carts for a, a project fairly recently. Some really, really cool stuff. Several thousand dollars. Highly designed, beautiful stuff. You're like, there's no way that someone's going to walk up to that thing and feel comfortable moving it around. It just doesn't communicate, oh, I, I'm, I have permission. I have invitation to move this around. Uh, so how, I think let, me, in, yeah, let me interrupt yeah. you and, and sort of sure. the question that, that's on my mind is there are two questions. And um, <laughs> the first one is how open and flexible does the space need to be for Where's the threshold? Do you have sort of a sense where, where it is? And the other question is like, if space is a design material, what are some of the properties of this design material that we have to be aware of? So, hmm. uh, I think on the threshold, the, the, for your first question, you know, how open or how flexible uh, and just those words alone kind of get into what's what, what can be a very common. It's, it's almost like a, it's a highly cyclical or sinusoidal sine wave, if you look at it that way. And it's it's often super boring to me. Not the question, but the where this goes is, oh, does an open office floor plan work? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think that is a very common um, topic. It's like talking mm -hmm. about the weather, like mm -hmm. talking about. Oh, it's, a, it's very hot here, but it's dry. Like, oh, God, another weather conversation. Um, so the, the open office thing is it can be, I think, really interesting in, in saying, yeah, maybe an open office doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, how was it applied in a certain context, which I think gets back to the, the, the much more interesting and, and you were really um, uh, astute in, in bringing it up, which like, what is the threshold? Uh, what thresholds exist? So some of those thresholds seem to be things that don't get prototyped or don't get um, evaluated before a final sort of mm. implementation takes shape. Mm. Meaning if, if an office, um, well, let's take an office, like a physical office. Actually, right now, for example, I'm, I'm in what is a prototype of faculty studio offices. This is highly unlikely or highly uncommon in a university setting or in a professional setting where you say, Oh, here are, I don't know, maybe 10 people that all have titles and ranks and duties and responsibilities and pride and all these, all these aspects, which could be translated into needs. Like, what does an office deliver? Oh, mm. It really services a bunch of needs. It squishes a bunch of other opportunities, but it does service a bunch of needs. So when a, like a broad stroke act of switching an organization, say, from individual offices or individual owned spaces where people felt a place, they felt home, they felt confident, they felt like they could invite guests, they had status. When that gets taken away, it's, uh, 
uh, traumatizing in a way, and it, and it elicits fear and anxiety very frequently. So you could immediately see, oh, if that just got taken away, well, I'm now walking into a brand new scenario at a loss. Mm, mm. <laughs> oh, I, used, I used to have, and now I've got, what? Oh, that's bad. So there's an interesting, um, I'd say necessary step in saying, you know, this really isn't about an office. It's about what are the behaviors that you're trying to support? What are the emotions that you're trying to support? And then saying, okay, if we're going to try something new, A, let's try something new. <laughs> let's practice with it a little bit. And then B, let's service those in ways that people can understand or offer them up. Um, you know, a tiny, tiny example is saying, okay, if you don't have your own private office, uh, but you share a, a, an immediate space with new colleagues or your colleagues, wow, you actually get to see what's going on in their world or what's going on in their work. That's great. Okay. You know you're going to have to have a private conversation at some point. You're going to have to take a phone call. Cool. How can we support that? An office supported that in the past, but let's say, oh, we now still have that need. It didn't go away simply because it was, you know, an office was taking off, taken off of a floor plan. Um, so I, I think in the, that, back to the, it's a little bit of a diversion there, but back to your uh, question about thresholds, uh, to me, it, it it shows up or thresholds seem to emerge in saying, what are the behaviors that you're trying to support or, and encourage? Um, and I would say then design in thresholds or design in permissions that might allow those behaviors. Hmm. And in some organizations, those, those permissions and behaviors might be less than in others, uh, which might take shape as like fixed furniture or fixed arrangements, or maybe not even a furniture solution, but like a, a norms or a, a cultural agreement saying, oh, we're quiet after 5 p.m. here. Okay, that's great. That's, that, that could be a, um, a community or a behavioral solution to a, what's often perceived as like a space problem. Um, so I, I'd say that I don't, on the thresholds, I mean, it depends is, is kind of a vague answer, but uh, I think there is something about saying, well, if you want to create new behaviors, you're going to have to si or support new behaviors. You're going to have to signal things um, in maybe new and different ways. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a matter of just showing up to work or to your office one day and saying, okay, everybody, it's now allowed to be creative and try new things. Okay, I don't quite know. You know like, uh, I hear that, but I'm not quite sure what that means because nothing around me has has changed. Um, so I mean, there's certainly a signaling that that uh, is important when trying to, you know, change behaviors. Um, All right. Yeah. Sorry. And I, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that you're in a prototype of a how did you the space you're in at the studio. Yeah, kind of a uh, like faculty studio as opposed to you know a hallway of individual offices. The faculty studio. All right, and um, the second topic because they, let's move into that um, is called relationship with prototyping, and maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about this one. Um, you can start with a question starter, and then I have another <laughs> one uh, ready for you. Wow. Uh, I, well. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll go with this one. I like this one sort of, um, how can we as designers, uh, I'd say designers and educators, this might fall more on the educators part. Hmm. How can we as designers and educators actually, uh, live up to the expectations that we supposedly teach, which is to say, uh, how do we use our practice to demonstrate our practice? Um, right. Right. I had a, had a sort of a mentor uh, at Stanford. His name is Matt Kahn. Uh, he was an artist and a designer early He's from Cranbrook. Uh, he had this um, constant challenge for people, which was to say, use design to design. Uh, so if you're looking around at a group of people who are designers and teach design, uh, presumably prototyping or trying something as part of a design practice, uh, I think there's a, a challenge of how can we make sure as designers, we are also prototyping things mm. as part of our practice, mm. as opposed mm. to the, just do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> uh, 
So in this case, uh, you know, I think this is quite specific to this room. Um, there's some extenuating circumstances that some uh, remodeling and construction that's going on on campus that coincided with an opportunity to try out new behaviors. Uh, so this is one way to say, oh, what a, this is an interesting opportunity. Uh, let's now be intentional about it as opposed to accidental uh, and say, ah, let's try something. Um, let's try something new. So we're prototyping what it's like to work uh, in this way. And, and some people, yeah. I, I think, are not necessarily viewing it uh, entirely as a prototype. They're saying, oh, this is a temporary thing or it's in between. Uh, whereas many are thinking, oh, this is cool. I'm, I'm excited about trying something out. And as with a prototype, I'm interested in trying something out to see what's next, to see mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to do uh, whatever, um, something something in the future. And that that's the funny and interesting thing with prototyping because basically um, everything is or can be a prototype. Um, even a, a sort of aesthetic office space could be like a prototype that stays the same for five years. So I think the, um, or at least I'm curious on your perspective on that, like the the time frame, frame in which you iterate and learn and progress to the next step, that's sort of really important in regards to relationship with prototyping. How fast are you actually able to change things? You know, the, gosh, you just identified such an important aspect of, of prototyping that I'm a, wasn't totally intuitive to me uh, for a long time. And I know it's not intuitive to students. Um, but it's duration. Hmm. So there, and there, there are politics of duration. Um, I'm currently working on a sort of prototyping book where that I've been not playing around with. That sounds dismissive, but I've been sort of, I don't know, chewing on this uh, a notion of the politics of duration in how a prototype impacts uh, a community or a population that may or may not be aware it's being mm -hmm. tested on or prototyped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a really good book uh, called Tactical Urbanism, which came out of an interesting blog. Um, uh, one of the authors, Mike Lydon, uh, has this uh, kind of a cool, um, I don't know if it's not a framework exactly, but he has a, a, like a rule of thumb, which is 48 by 48 by 48. When he thinks about designing prototypes or interventions to test something. So what can you do in the first 48 hours, which then leads to, uh, next 48 days and then the next 48 weeks. So there's always a notion of this act or this activity has a finite uh, runtime. And in that runtime, we're hoping to learn something. So whether that is the desired output or not, uh, you know, is, is to be determined, but there's going to be an outcome from that. It's going that. to be a lesson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So then take those and advance on this kind of incremental thing. Um, step now whether that has to be that exact 48 48 48 mm -hmm, works great mm -hmm, with, mm -hmm. with his context but there are a lot of things of saying like uh well scott dorley who's the creative director at the d school uh had a <laughs> i don't know if this is totally his saying but he he brought it up but you know like a thing is only temporary once it gets removed so there's a notion of uh like temporary buildings on school campuses or like a post-it that's put on your wall, that's a fundamentally temporary item. It was, it had a, uh, like a, an ephemerality to its design, <laughs> but if it's still around, it's not temporary. It's, it's still there. Uh, so a prototype can, I don't know, like rot on the vine, so to speak. Like if it doesn't go away, A, it's not a prototype anymore. Uh, and it may have exactly the opposite impact or effect on the the population you know with which it's being uh, evaluated mm -hmm. meaning oh god they just they said this was only going to be a little while but it's been forever and now you're subverting trust and all kinds of uh, other issues there so it's it's really doing yourself a disservice as a designer to uh, 
I think of a prototype as, I don't know, something that's, um, it is, it can be light and it can, it should have temporariness, but it isn't like a trivial topic. There's something actually quite serious about it. It's got some rules, uh, but it can also be quick and light touch and light duty. Uh, and you can learn a lot from a little, you know, from a little effort. And I, and I think uh, the other topic that you touched upon, like uh, duration is a thing, but also um, intention, because mm. if, if you can call it a prototype, but if you it, if it's not with the intention to learn something, if it then it becomes just a thing that's temporary. It's right. It's we're building the space to learn how people interact with each other or how we can increase social whatever. You have to have that in, intention in a prototype, and you have to have sort of a time scale yeah i think the you know the intention well actually something i'm constantly trying to do <laughs> and now trying to figure out how to share in an articulate way with students is uh is how to have your intentionality as a designer show up in your work mm. particularly when it is a prototype which itself is not something maybe that you would buy on a shelf or that you would go down to a store and get, or it's not uh, like commerce per se, but it is every bit as designed as an output. Hmm, hmm. So, you know, in a, a, a prototype experience, I don't know, almost maybe more so than a final design, has to be totally aware of uh, and conscientious of like limiting the number of variables at play. Like if you walked into a, a prototype situation and it too closely um, sort of aligned with maybe a final output, the people running through that prototype might be confused. And as a result, your prototype might take longer or it might not read as being effective. So there's this really strong skill, uh, a skill that can be very strong, is to know how to edit, particularly when you're implementing a prototype. What doesn't matter at this moment? Exactly. And and what shouldn't be there? Actually, that's a I'm borrowing again from Scott Dorley, my <laughs> colleague, but the the uh, Anton Chekhov, the playwright. There's this notion of Chekhov's gun, uh, which is a uh, a perspective that if you're looking at a play like theatrically, like everything builds sequentially in a logical order on stage. Mm -hmm. So you see, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. this happens, this happens, that happens, and so forth. So there's a notion that this Chekhov's gun is if you see a gun on stage, it's going to go off. Uh, and in a prototype, the notion is make sure everything that's seen counts, because if it's if it doesn't count, it is still seen and it can be very confusing. So as a designer, particularly as a prototype designer, there's a real sneaky <laughs> like skill that needs to be practiced of how to edit and, and mm. how to distill. And the people who are watching and listening to this episode might be thinking, I, I tuned into the wrong podcast or the wrong <laughs> video. This is about service design. But what I what I think what we, there's so much to learn about uh, the fact that services, a lot of them happen in physical environments and mm. well, even in digital environments, but I like the physical aspect where experiences are shaped and that's the thing we can actually build and prototype and iterate upon and see how people react when they go through a sequence. So that's, uh, yeah. Scott, we need to move on to uh, to your third topic because again, this is sort of an um, maybe an outlier, liner, outlier. What's the what's the right English <laughs> word? Yeah, uh, outlier. That works. outlier. This one uh, is called small scale builders, and I can assure you that we haven't had this one on the show yet. <laughs> so, what's the what's the question started that goes along with this one? Wow, uh, I'm going to go with. Um provided me so many good good topics here. I'm going to go with, I'm, I've got to start with an ellipse. All I'm right. Gonna, I'm gonna, the wild I'm card. I want to say, but I think what, what can we uh, as designers, uh, well, as anybody really learn from small scale uh, builders? And, I, and in particular, I would say <laughs> I'm, I'm super interested in musical instruments. Uh, and I continue to look at small scale um manufacturers and builders of instruments as a 
like an analogous source of inspiration. Interesting. Uh, and there's something quite, yeah. well, there's many things that are quite cool about it, but um, I, a, few, a few things that stand out to me. Uh, so many builders now are trying to find a new identity in a very history rich past. That's, I, mean, I guess history and past is redundant, but there's something about, uh, with regard to guitars, with regard to instruments, everything having been built by hand, you know, from chopping down the tree to planing to finishing, everything has been done by hand before. Mm -hmm. That's done. It's mm -hmm. known. That's precedent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, likewise, from recent history, everything having been built or being able to be built by computer controlled machinery, uh, new software, new techniques, that's all been done uh, or it's been precedented. The, mm -hmm. the future of that isn't known totally, but it's been done. So uh, those people who are interested in the craft and those people who are continuing to work are now faced with, oh, uh, if I'm choosing to be all handmade, well, someone did that before me. So why am I choosing that? Am I doing that to be stubborn? Am I doing that because I want to suffer for my art? Uh, well, if that's the case, you're probably not going to make that many instruments. And perhaps in your business model, you might not, you know, make that much money. Mm. Um, that's something that's well known to you ahead of time. Uh, likewise you said, Oh, I want to make really high end things and, and want them to feel great. And people, um, will think these are authentic and they'll feel great about them. And I can crank them out all day long. Well, we know that people often don't have a connected feel or an authentically connected feel to things that are sort of mass produced. That often is the case. So if you went that route and that's what you thought, well, you, you kind of made a mistake. So anyway, there's a really interesting uh, self identification and self identity that new builders are having to take drawing from these, uh, I don't know, like a, a spectrum or a range. And I, as far as designers go, whether that's product, service, experience, interaction, what have you, uh, I think there's a really interesting challenge to say, you know what, you in fact have to draw from a spectrum uh, as opposed to being the one single example that's going to be shining and will be it from now on. Um, it's foolish, I, I think, to, to not uh, recognize that you're drawing from so many influences. That does not mean that you don't have a creative and original future. Uh, however, it, it does mean that probably you're treading on trodden trails to quote Dave mm -hmm. Matthews, which mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> um, so that's, that's something, uh, that exists. Uh, and I think there's back to the, like this, what can we learn? I, the state of small scale, high end guitar builders has never been as good as it is right now. Uh, nor has the community among those builders been as strong, uh, meaning that people are sharing knowledge and people are sharing tools, people are sharing adaptations. So for example, as some type of hardwood becomes unavailable or there's a specific one, there's a particular tool that was developed by a guy named Charles Fox decades ago that had to do with bending sides of guitars. And it, it, it involved putting incandescent heat generating light bulbs in this kind of rounded box and uh, bending wood around that. Well, it's very hard to get incandescent light bulbs anymore because apparently they're not efficient for, <laughs> you know, some light purposes. Well, that, uh, so that fixturing in that tool now has to be changed. And, and there's lots of instances where this community is sharing um, a lot of information among each other. Um, I think one other thing, actually, this was, <laughs> you and I were talking earlier about um, a role that you once provided as a, uh, an IT, um, uh, uh, I don't know, how would you describe it? How would you describe it, Mark? Support, support, uh, guy. It was, uh, in the early days of the internet, I was helping people to set up their emails. Yeah, that's great. So that's, I mean, you're like a, a scout or sort of like right at the, the front of the Vanguard, I guess, like right at the front saying, ah, oh, here's a whole new thing. And here's what has to happen. So in some way, particularly with guitars, 
uh, that has happened in the past. Where it's like, oh, here's broad strokes instructions of how to make a guitar, or how to make a violin, or how to make a banjo that usually were in books. And these books were amazing. They were effectively like the open source free information. And someone who made brilliant guitars now shared all that information in books. Amazing. And decades and decades of builders followed that. There is a thing uh, that's going on now, which I would offer up is like the second tier, almost like the safety net of stuff that fell between the cracks. Meaning like, oh, I get that. If I want to build this, I need something that looks generally like this. Well, there's countless instances where you're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> or what, what are these little in-between kind of micro things? Uh, like, oh, I didn't know that. Anyway, the, the same way, the same freeness and sort of generosity, I think that the older guitar building community had in sharing information and passing that information on, it is flourishing currently in many um, platforms, one of which happens to be YouTube, which is quite magnificent as a, and totally bizarre as a tool. Uh, but there's all kinds of like secondary support that is so nuanced uh, that it's really upping everybody's game. It's like bumping up the skill level of all the builders. And I think there's something, if, if the design community could, could look to that for a moment and say, you know what, there's been so many independent consultancies, or there's been so many egos and reputations built on being the one. Um, there's now this flip in saying, oh, it's a value to be an educator. I mean, look at <laughs> like any number of really high-end consultancies that never in the past, it did not fit a business model to give away their tactics or their techniques. And you can see it happening all the time now where people are flipping, these organizations are flipping to the model of, oh, there's value in being an educator or acting like an educator. And educators are saying, uh, yeah, <laughs> by the way, uh, now can we just get consultancy pay for being an educator mm. and being a teacher? Mm. That's a whole other issue. But mm. there's, a, I, I think there's an interesting, um, or I, I find it interesting to take inspiration from an analogous example, such as, you know, small scale instrument builders and say, wow, there's a flourishing community and there are a bunch of specific behaviors that have served it so well in the past and are serving it well now. Uh, wow. Maybe we can take those or adapt those, you know, in a, in a parallel path, um, in service design, product design, space design, just design, 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 design. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, I, I, I find inspiration in, in lots of uh, uh, lots of different spots. And I, music always, <laughs> in one form or another, seems to be some kind of uh, inspirational uh, fountain. This, uh, this uh, pledge or uh, your, yeah, your pledge for, uh, for small scale builders, it really reminds me to a topic that has been on the show a few times, and that's the topic of craftsmanship. Like, is ah. there a community of craftsmen? Uh, around that sort of are deeply passionate about the work they do and they share it because they just want to spread uh i don't know what what is it spread spread their the craft and i think compared to people who are making physical stuff or cooks or where we're not quite there yet not sure why but um yeah it's it's coming Wow, that is that's really interesting. What the a distinction you just made about like people who are practitioners of craft and deep craft, uh, but whose output is temporary. So if you take cooks or chefs, you know their their last meal, <laughs> I don't maybe forgotten, and in some ways that's their product, uh, and in other ways the I don't know repeatability might be a product hmm. Uh, hmm. or hmm. finding new inspiration each Involvement. time. Involvement. Like constantly yeah. surprising yeah. an audience. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, huh. <clears throat> Scott, um, I know you haven't prepared for this question, so that's always <laughs> uh, a nice one. But is there anything Great. is there anything you'd like to ask us, the viewers and the listeners of the show, anything that we can chew up on? Hmm. Well, it is a service design show. It is. Uh, or it's that by name. Uh, so whether people tune into it for that or not, uh, 
I don't know. That would be an interesting thing. I am curious if if someone is tuning in and listening um, in the context of service design, or they were motivated to say, "Oh, what what is what does service design mean to me?" or uh, "What is important about service design to me?" Uh, I'd be curious to know why. Um, and further, I, I'd be curious to know if your interpretation of service design is different than someone else's, uh, what, I don't know, what implication does that have or how do you react to that? Uh, I don't know whether it's correct or not. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when people feel slighted or somehow f uh, insulted might be too strong a word, but if someone said, um, well, let me side example. Uh, and I was, when I was at UT Austin as a student, I was studying to be a, a structural engineer or practicing in structural engineering, uh, in civil engineering at that time, um, in order to call yourself an engineer, like legally and literally call yourself an engineer, you could not, uh, until you were, um, you had gone through a period of accreditation. Um, which kind of like an internship or a journeyman practice for, say, a carpenter. Um, number of years, you have to go through an accreditation, you have to take tests and all this, and then you can say, oh, I'm an engineer. In, you know, the states, that's in some ways largely like a, a legal formality for mm -hmm. <laughs> litigious mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, Americans are litigious. Um, but there was something about that, and meaning, oh, I am an engineer. And likewise, not saying uh, I'm an engineer until I'm an engineer. Architects still practice mm -hmm. this. You might mm -hmm. be a designer mm -hmm. at an architecture firm, but you're not an architect until you're an architect. Um, so I'm curious now, the term engineer uh, applies broadly and many, many people practice engineering, not civil engineering necessarily or mechanical engineering, but computer engineering or um, in some cases electrical engineering, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole range. Uh, you know, in some way, <laughs> there's a like, well, can anybody just be an engineer or does it mean anything? Um, I don't know if that has to be a, a negative thing, but there is something about it when you say, oh, I'm defining myself by these terms. I should maybe think about what does or what does that mean to me or what does it not? What am I willing to say? Uh, I'm OK if someone else calls themselves an engineer. That's great. They're doing something you know, cool. Uh, so I, that was a long parallel path, but I'm curious, like for those who are interested in service design or call themselves service designers or want to become service designers, uh, what is it about that uh, construct or that title that uh, feels important to mm. you uh, to, mm. to pursue? And that uh, I'm really curious to the responses uh, to this in relationship to the previous topic we talked about, about a community of people that just are sharing a craft without going through any sort of accreditation. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a guitar builder. I'm a good guitar builder. I don't have any legal papers. I, I'm just practicing it. So that's that's a really interesting topic. Um, curious what people will come up with. Uh, you, I think you opened uh, a small snake pit, uh, Scott. Let's see. <laughs> um, thanks. So much, man. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on. I'm looking forward to your next book because you already hinted around that you're working on something. So let's see when when that is out. Uh, it was great to have somebody from on, from the fringes of the service design community sharing <laughs> his his thoughts and ideas. It's refreshing. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity, uh, and I really enjoy the show and and your work. So it's been uh, really fun for me to be here with you too. So to recap Scott's question, what makes service design, service design, and what makes a service designer a service designer? When can you call yourself a service designer? Leave a comment down below and let's see what comes up. If you enjoyed this episode, grab the link and make sure to share it with just one other person today who might enjoy it as well. And you'll help to grow the service design show family. If you wanna see more, that's possible. Click this video over here and I'll see you over there.